So welcome everyone to uh, this um, regional session number six, which is on um, SDG linked uh, thematic debt instruments. Uh, we, we all know that, uh, that our, our clean energy in investments uh, are able to attract uh, green bonds and climate bonds and um, you know, investment instruments which are linked to the um, greenhouse gas benefits of clean energy. But there's an, there's an opportunity to use these types of instruments to, um, to promote and, um, and uh, measure um, other benefits for SDGs, such as gender, uh, water use, um, poverty reduction, employment. And the purpose of this, this session is to, um, is, is to hear from three very experienced people that work in this area. Um, one from a verifier, one from a bank, and one from a, uh, a, a corporate. And I'll, I'll introduce them as they begin to speak. Um, we're, we're going to have um, uh, some short presentations and then a panel discussion, and then we'll open the session up uh, for questions a bit later on. So without any further uh, ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Mark Robinson from DNV. Mark is a sustainable and energy consultant based in Sydney with experience providing advisory and assurance services to industry, government, and financial institutions across Europe, Africa, Asia, the Pacific, and North America. Mark has over a decade of experience providing consulting, audit, and assurance services for sustainable finance, deals to the public and private sector and development banks globally. So uh, over to you, Mark. Thanks very much, Noel. Um, it's a pleasure and a privilege to, uh, to be a part of this session today. And I, I guess as part of, um, of our offering, um, we've prepared, prepared some information here that's um, intended to give a little bit of background um, to the SPO and verification perspective on all of this. And to do that, we've sort of answered a few sort of key questions and addressed some key topics. So by way of introduction, um, DNV is an independent insurance and risk management company. Um, these are, you know, the, the basic fundamentals of the company, but um, ultimately our purpose is to safeguard life property in the environment and our vision is to be a, a trusted voice to tackle global transformation. So that's our approach to the services that we provide, including in sustainable finance. So to dive right in, I think it's worthwhile to just touch on the, the key sustainable finance mechanisms that are out there. There's generally two broad pathways at the moment for sustainable finance. Um, there's use of proceeds uh, mechanisms and sustainability linked or behavior based mechanisms. And within the use of proceeds arena, you have um, principles and standards like the, the green bond principles, the social bond principles, the climate bond standard, um, the climate transition finance handbook, and a number of uh, local and regional taxonomies that are being developed. So this kind of, this, this kind of mechanism is, is really focused on what the proceeds of an instrument are, are being used for. On the other hand, we have um, sustainable, sustainability linked um, or behavior-based instruments. And this is really focused instead on the performance of an organization, uh, a corporate or a project, um, focused on some key, key performance indicators. Um, and this is, this is sort of in the place of the use of proceeds focus. And the purpose of the sustainability linked mechanism is to really benchmark some sort of financial or loan or instrument based attribute to that sustainability performance. So if you meet or exceed your targets, you get a discount on the interest rate or the coupon and so on. So there's two distinct pathways here and they can cross over, but it's useful to, to consider that. This then gives rise to any number of different sorts of instruments. So blue bonds, social bonds, sustainability bonds, uh, ESG bonds, sustainability linked bonds, and of course, green bonds. And they have their own uh, unique sort of attributes and, and, uh, and benefits. Now, from a verifier's or an external reviewer's perspective, there's some key stages of a sustainable finance deal. Uh, these are sort of the key events that will happen uh, from our perspective through, through the process of the deal. 
And that's really, you know, starting off with the initial discussion. So reaching out to uh, discuss the potential uh, of a deal and, and the appetite to go ahead with it. Um, often at this early stage, we'll broadly discuss the, uh, the, the applicability or the appropriateness of uses of proceeds or KPIs. Um, we'll go through a formal proposal and agreement process um, where we'll be formally engaged and then we dive into the, the process. So we'll collect information, we'll request information, conduct reviews, verifications, interviews and so on, and then prepare a report or an SPO document. And then from there, if it's desired or required, um, we would then engage on a periodic basis to, to provide updates on an SPO or periodic verification activities um, for the instrument and the issuer. So what does it take to achieve certification or an SPO? And what are the steps that, that really need to be undertaken? So for a green bond principles uh, SPO, um, the, the focus is very much on the structure and performance of the, of the framework. So we'll consider uh, you know, a draft framework or help an issue or put together a framework around the four key pillars um, of use of proceeds, process for project evaluation and selection, management of proceeds and reporting. Um, we would conduct an assessment potentially of a bond at that point in time as well and then prepare um, you know, an NSPO statement um, in relation to that. And again, potentially periodic verification. From a certification perspective, the, the, the process is divided up into pre and post issuance events. So there's more of a compliance and verification activity happening here. Um, and it's something that happens twice. So before the bond is issued and then again to, to follow up afterwards. And that post issuance verification is really about confirming the allocation of proceeds as promised. So this is probably getting closer to the, the purpose of this session is looking at impact reporting in the SDGs. So considering impacts associated with an instrument um, for use of proceeds, um, you're really looking at and considering special special considerations such as information availability from project or asset holders and managers. How far these are away from the bond issuer will depend on their structure, their function, whether they're corporates, whether they're government treasuries, whether they're um, operating on a securitized basis for the issuance and so on. And so, you know, looking at the lines of communication and the reporting frequency of metrics associated with those projects is really critical to being able to have the confidence that you're going to have the data and you're going to have the information in hand when it comes time for you to report and link up to, you know, your impacts and express your impact. Um, there's other things to be considered like legal hurdles for disclosure of projects and, and performance data and then considering benchmarks um, that you're going to be reaching out to and connection up to reporting tools like the SDGs. And then more broadly looking at, at, at reporting, this, this uh, for a use of proceeds uh, instrument will, will include allocation reporting, which is the specifics about the instrument, how much of it has been allocated to projects, uh, temporary investments and so on. Um, and then secondary to that is the impact reporting um, associated with the projects and assets and how they're performing from an environmental or social basis. So bringing this back, um, look, the SDGs have become a really popular impact reporting metric and tool. Um, and even in some instances, a, 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 a basis for an issuance platform um, in some cases, which has been a really interesting twist and, and a, a change in direction, sort of borrowing, you know, the purpose of the SDGs and the structure of the traditional, you know, green bond principles, social bond principles, skeleton or framework with the four key pillars there and, and, and bringing them together. But the, the utilisation and connection up to SDGs is still a relatively new concept to many people and, and to... Um, there's a number of challenges depending on where you sit in the market and um, 
That, that can include recognising that each SDG has specific targets that set out the nature and the, um, the nature of the impact and the intended pathway to achievement. So um, many SDG related impacts, for example, in the private sector are only linked up to the assumed SDG level um, and don't apparently have a, a target level connection. Um, another challenge is, is reporting dead ends. So a lot of the private sector SDG reporting that's being conducted is done relatively informally and uses a variety of metrics, meaning that the activities are, are not necessarily flowing through or the contributions are not necessarily flowing through to NDCs or national level data. Um, and then there's confusion over appropriate linkages and, and understanding what um, reasonable linkages are. So there's, there's sort of intangible, um, there's intangible and qualitative aspects to this. So considering, you know, how, um, how, how you're going to make the linkages and what linkages are appropriate and, and what, what magnitudes of performance are going to be appropriate for any particular activity. So there's a, there's a lot to consider there and there's a lot of unwritten, um, uh, unwritten guidance um, that's out there uh, that's really important to issuers. And so looking at the broader value of SDGs to sustainable finance, the SDGs were developed to address um, global process, global process progress, sorry, on, on, on key sustainable um, development issues. And so, as sustainable finance as a subject matter and a market segment matures, um, these are, are even more focused on, um, you know, the, 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 the market has been traditionally focused on the, the principles and standards, such as the green bond principles, uh, the social bond principles, the, the climate bond standard focusing on their particular area and so what the SDGs have, have really achieved is they've broadened people's awareness um, both issuer side stakeholder investor side about the contribution and importance of the broader sustainable sustainable development agenda and so from our perspective and from what we see we would expect this to continue to grow as a basis for reporting and even issuance we think it'll help broaden the focus of issuers and investors um, from green social um, focuses towards sustainable development and um, working towards the specific needs and goals of the, the targets themselves. And also working to better align the purpose of the sustainable finance markets to um, the bigger picture, which has traditionally been the realm of DFIs. And so look, the, the, there's a lot of contribution, there's a lot of impact out there. So in the, in the clean energy sector, we're really seeing a lot of potential to leverage the bigger picture, to leverage tools like the SDGs, to, to, to broaden the scope, focus and impact of, of sustainable finance in general. So thank you. So thanks, Mark. I think that gives a, a, a very good and you know concise overview of the fundamental elements of what we're talking about, um, and, and I think there's some opportunity for this, some discussion later on. Um, I, I'm now going to hand over to David Jenkins from National Australia Bank. Uh, David leads NAB's sustainable finance team and has been active in sustainable debt markets for over 10 years. He works closely with NAB's treasury, coverage and capital market teams, servicing customers across Australia, New Zealand, Asia, the UK and USA developing and originating sustainable finance and investment solutions for NAB and its clients. Uh, David has been responsible for all sustainable capital market transactions NAB has brought to market and is an active member of Australian and international industry bodies. And I, I have to say, I, I think David is something of a pioneer in, in, in this particular field and, and it has an incredible amount of experience, um, as, as do the other speakers, but, but David in particular was one of the first people to get to, to, to get climate bonds going for, for banks. So it's, it's uh, my pleasure to hand over to David. Thanks, Noel, um, very flattering. And, and just to explain, um, I joined National Australia Bank in 2010. And shortly after that started exploring the idea of um, issuing a green bond off the bank's own balance sheet. And what we soon found is that the market was very, very immature. 
Um, and the examples we had to look at were from some of the global development banks at that stage. Um, it was really only limited to the EIB and the World Bank. So in exploring that concept further, um, being a big lender into renewable energy in Australia, we saw an opportunity to, to issue bonds to finance that growing balance sheet. Um, and as part of that, uh, we took on feedback from investors that we needed to have um, credible third party assurance provided um, with any green bond that we brought to market. So that led us down the path of seeking a climate bond standards certified green bond. Um, and as part of that process, we engaged with the team at DNVGL back as early as 2011. So Noel deserves as much credit. He was um, formative in some of these early discussions we had to, to build a green bond issuance platform and help the team at the CBI develop their standards. So since that, um, we've built on there from the pure climate mitigation focused green bonds um, to where we are today as a bank. Um, NAB itself is an Australian domicile bank, but we've, we've, we are very active in the UK, Europe, to a lesser extent in Asia uh, with our Australian customers, but increasingly in, in BNZ. So by virtue of what we've been doing for a long time now, um, we've been recognised as Australia's top rated uh, bank in the Corporate Knights Global Sustainable Corporations Index. We're a founding member of the UNEPFI's Principles for Responsible Banking and are proud to have signed up to their collective commitment to climate action, which means we're aligning our portfolio um, to the targets that have been established under the Paris Agreement, striving for below two degrees. Um, in terms of what we've done, uh, as Noel started on in 2014... Excuse me, so David, I just want to yep. interrupt you for, for a moment. Could you, could you put your slides on full screen, please? I think they're... Uh, they're not, not currently on full screen. Okay, I think I've got the wrong screen up if I take that back. Um, does that work better? Is that full screen? That's uh, full screen now. Yep, that's working. Okay, sorry, apologies there. Um, so to, to Noel's point, in 2014 here in Australia, we, we brought the first green bond into our domestic market. But since then, the market has really moved along at pace. So um, in the Australian example, we were able to issue a social bond, which was aligned to the ICMA social bond principles in 2017. Um, we then were able to issue a green RMBS, so um, residential mortgage-backed security in 2018. Um, in Australia, we were able to bring the first sustainability bond, which combined green and social use of proceeds. Um, for the Australian Catholic University in 2017. Um, we we're also, together with the team at DNV, able to uh, bring the first retail green turn deposit that was Climate Bond certified to market for our digital bank, UBank. And then we've worked with a range of other um, counterparts. Um, some of the interesting examples are Australia's first syndicated sustainability link loan was done for Sydney Airport. They then followed that up with a sustainability linked to US private placement. And in that case, that was based on an ESG risk rating that was provided by Sustainalytics. Since then, we've seen continued innovation in the sustainable finance world. Um, earlier this year, we worked on a transaction in the UK, which was uh, the world's first social bond aligned RMBS. And that refinanced the portfolio of residential mortgages that were um, provided to non high street borrowers. So people that wouldn't be eligible for to get a home loan mortgage from a high street lender, whether it be from their complex credit history, self-employed, older age borrowers, et cetera. And, and that transaction was structured in accordance with the ICMA social bond principles. Um, and through the last couple of years, as Mark may have touched on, we really have seen the explosion in terms of sustainability linked financing. And that's taken the form of bonds and loans. Um, and that allows many corporate borrowers to raise, raise debt that um, improves their sustainability profile without having to have specific use of proceeds, which has to be deployed for either green or social purposes. If I just very quickly, I mean, you can see from this chart, it shows you how the, the mix of sustainable financing instruments has changed over time. And this is only going back to 2016. But if I look at 2020, around 325 
billion US of green bonds were issued in 2020, but that was only a fraction of the market. The balance were made up of sustainability linked loans, sustainability linked bonds, green loans, sustainability bonds, and um, I believe there was one more that I haven't captured there, but 2021 is on target to easily surpass what was brought to market in 2020. Um, the Australian example is not much different. It was a bit subdued in 2020, but that's as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Mark touched earlier about the difference between proceeds-based debt or use of proceeds stroll instruments. And as I mentioned earlier, that can be green bonds, green securitization, green funds. So by that, I mean listed or unlisted equity funds. SDG theme bonds, green hybrid debt instruments, social RMBS and the likes, and then the behavioral based instruments, which are the sustainability linked loans, sustainability linked bonds. And we're now starting to see the emergence of sustainability linked derivatives and sustainable trade and supply chain finance. So these are all very rapidly growing spaces. And I think you'll see a lot more of this appearing in Asia. Um, certainly in our markets, we're seeing a, a lot of interest uh, and in the corporate space, it would easily be um, a multiple of two, if not three times of in interest for sustainability linked financing as opposed to traditional use of proceeds at the moment. This will just give you an idea of how the rapid flow of funds into this sustainable investing spectrum has gathered pace. Um, Bloomberg estimate that by 2025, almost a third of uh, global funds under management will have some form of ESG, so environmental, social or governance overlay or screening on in place. So that will exceed $53 trillion, or it's estimated to be in excess of a third of the global funds under management. No longer niche. Um, here in Australia, we are a very small piece of that, but we, we continue to see that in terms of the investor-led demand to support sustainable investing and to support um, investment in meeting the sustainable sustainability objectives of the SDGs and the Paris Agreement. Um, some of the reasons behind that is, is really a rising focus on ESG risk, but increasingly ESG risk is top of mind for financial institutions. So, um, and that surpasses cybersecurity, credit, um, and some of the social issues that we've seen elsewhere. Um, it continues to remain at the fore. We expect to see more of that. And on the left-hand side, you can see here, even though 2020 saw COVID-19 come to the fore, four of the top five global risks that the World Economic Forum identified were all environmental related. We expect that to continue, but what it has done through the pandemic period is really bring um, a focus on the S and the G elements of environmental, social and governance risk. There, there are numerous examples um, and our next speaker will be speaking to you around the NL example. Um, they were one of the pioneers in terms of SDG themed debt, um, but we've seen increasing numbers of green or social bond issuers come to market and explicitly linking contribution towards sustainable development goals. Um, so I'll quickly move through. So there are some guidance and um, examples of aligning the sustainable development goals to green bond and social bond project categories. So here we've listed the social bond project categories and green bond project categories. Um, and they're a good example as a tool to highlight the impact. So I'll wrap up there. I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, David. Um, really, really useful to set the scene for where the where the market's developing and um, what 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 NAP has done. I'll um, I think we have more to discuss there. Uh, I'll hand over to uh, Nicole now. Nicole delivered over from Anel as a senior manager whose career has steadily advanced in almost 15 years of activity in financial markets among different countries, uh, different industries. In 2016, she joined Anel SBA as head of group capital markets within the finance and insurance department. She's recognized as a leading expert in the sustainable finance space, and she participated in the drafting of the sustainability linked bond principles re released by uh, ICMA. So over to you, Nicole. Thank you very much. And good afternoon to, to everybody. Maybe I'll start uh, with, uh, with a short uh, summary of 
of, uh, of the presentation. Uh, I, I will start, uh, uh, let's say, representing in a nutshell who NL is and the, our sustainable business model that will activate 190 billion euros of investment for the energy transition in the period 2021-2030. Then I will move uh, on the sustainable finance. So what uh, we think sustainable finance uh, should do, so and our sustainability link bond, and then the sustainability link financing framework, uh, and uh, also how we start uh, with sustainable finance, because also uh, in NL we started with, uh, with green bonds. Then the, the milestone that uh, certified uh, the um, success uh, of the sustainability linked uh, instrument uh, so the icma principles uh, the ecb eligibility and of course also the uh, other issues that came uh, to the market uh, with uh, this kind of, of product uh, then uh, i will touch base briefly also on the development finance industry and uh, what uh, we are uh, uh, trying to do and uh, on what we are working on with the a development institution uh, uh, trying also there uh, to uh, switch uh, from a pure use of proceeds uh, financing towards a much uh, uh, more, uh, let's say, towards a, a framework loan and uh, much more general type of general corporate type of general corporate purpose, sorry, objective. So here, uh, who, who we are, uh, we have created uh, the world's uh, largest private renewable operator with 49 gigawatt of uh, renewable installed capacity. And uh, we are the uh, fast growing uh, player in, in this space. We are the biggest uh, network operator with more than 74 million uh, end users uh, and the most uh, advanced, uh, we are also the most advanced in digital transformation of networks. And uh, we manage the largest uh, customer base uh, serving 70 million customers uh, around the world. And uh, I think that our results in, in 2020 have uh, proven uh, the resiliency of our integrated business model and the 164 total shareholder return achieved over the past five years uh, is uh, a recognition of the industrial value that uh, we have uh, created uh, over time. Now moving to, to our plan, uh, we plan to invest uh, around 160 billion to 2030 through our ownership uh, and stewardship business model catalyzing uh, around 30 billion of uh, third party investments. Uh, in 10 years, uh, the group uh, will add a total of 95,000 megawatt of renewables capacity, more than trebling uh, the 2020 install base. And uh, we expect uh, 75,000 uh, megawatt to be fully consolidated and uh, the rest uh, managed uh, through uh, third parties, for third parties. And uh, we grow our renewable business and uh, in line uh, with uh, the transformation of the energy system, uh, we will uh, invest uh, into our uh, regulated asset base that will reach uh, 70 billion euro, around 70% uh, higher than today. And of course, we will continue to invest also in our uh, uh, NLX uh, business unit that is uh, that the business unit that uh, will serve, uh, that will provide uh, services uh, and that will grow its uh, solution uh, to B2C, B2B and uh, B2G uh, customers. Uh, this is uh, in a nutshell one, what an L is. And uh, here we do have uh, the, the path uh, towards, uh, um, uh, towards transformation and uh, uh, sustainable shared, uh, shared value. Uh, with the, our renewables, uh, we will save uh, more than 200 million barrels uh, of oil equivalent uh, by 2030. Uh, and uh, this is uh, more in line with, uh, with the decarbonization. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, let's say that uh, as an ELA, we have also decided to read uh, the ESG aspect uh, under 
the SDGs, also, um, uh, let's say, uh, creating a direct link between our core business and the specific SDG. In particular, you have uh, chosen four main SDGs uh, that are SDG uh, 7, um, mainly linked uh, to our global power generation business, so mainly linked to the generation of, uh, of energy. Uh, then uh, we do have uh, SDG 9 and uh, SDG um, um, 11 uh, that are mainly linked uh, to our infrastructure and network uh, division and our analytics uh, division. So we're speaking about infrastructure and, of course, um, uh, sustainable, um, sustainable cities. And uh, um, then uh, we have, of course, uh, the SDG uh, 13 uh, that is uh, cross uh, all our business uh, because we have taken clear commitment in, term, in terms of uh, GHG reduction. And uh, these SDGs are at the base also of our sustainable finance uh, because we do see sustainable finance uh, as uh, part of our business. So we do think that the finance should serve the business uh, within, uh, within a company and uh, should be seen as an accelerator uh, towards uh, sustainable investments uh, and uh, here it comes uh, our uh, sustainable finance uh, trajectory as i was saying at the beginning uh, we started uh, with uh, with green bonds uh, and uh, we successfully issued uh, uh, three green bonds uh, for uh, a total amount uh, of uh, uh, 3.5 uh, billion euro, billion um, billion euro uh, and, that, and then after the third green bond, uh, um, we just uh, wondering uh, why we should be still on, on the projects and uh, not uh, elevating the transparency at the strategy level, therefore linking our debt to our strategy and linking also the cost of that uh, uh, with, uh, with our strategy. And given the fact uh, that uh, as a company we have decided to link uh, our business uh, to SDGs, uh, we have identified when it comes uh, to sustainable finance uh, two specific SDGs that are SDG 7 and SDG 13 that are of course clearly linked to our core business uh, and in particular when it comes to SDG 7, we, had, we have identified as a metric, as a KPI, the uh, renewable installed capacity overall, the total capacity. And when it comes uh, to SDG 13, we have identified uh, the reduction of uh, GHG. And what we have done, uh, of course, after multiple uh, discussion also with uh, and in, in interaction, more, more than discussion with investors, uh, trying to understand uh, which uh, uh, could be what which was the, the best structure also for, for them. Uh, what we have done is uh, to, uh, let's say, put a step up into the structure, the structure of the bond. So what we are saying with sustainability link bond is that if we do not reach a predetermined target at a predetermined date, we will have a step up in our coupon. In the same time, at the, at the beginning, uh, uh, what uh, we asked uh, to invest uh, was a kind of a discount uh, uh, since, uh, uh, since inception. Why that? Because the, let's say that sustainability link bonds uh, uh, came from sustainability link loans, uh, but the contrary to the sustainability link loans, uh, we do not have a step down. We, we just have a step, down, a step up. Why? because an, a lot of investors uh, need to have a floor in their portfolio and therefore putting uh, a step down uh, could have been uh, uh, could have be, been jeopardized the, the, the transaction therefore what uh, uh, we are saying with sustainability link bond and what we asked for investor was a discount just to demonstrate that there is value behind sustainability because we do think that uh, sustainability means uh, economic and uh, uh, financial value because the sustainable companies are uh, more resilient and uh, less risky and therefore should deserve a lower cost of debt. This is uh, the main reason that uh, we have uh, uh, done and it is under, uh, behind our sustainability link bond. In 2020, we then enlarged the sustainability link 
in the uh, financial in instrument uh, spectrum also to uh, revolving credit facility to loans uh, to commercial papers uh, and that's why we have decided to put in place the sustainability linked uh, financial financing fra framework which cover all our instruments we do have an external certification from uh, uh, video on this um, on this framework uh, uh, and this of course aligned uh, with the sustainability linked uh, mm, with the sustainability linked uh, bond principle that has been released uh, by the ICMA in June 2020. As I was saying uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, we have decided to choose uh, we have chosen uh, two main KPIs when it comes to sustainable finance uh, that are direct greenhouse gas emission amount, uh, scope one uh, emission, and then renewable install capacity. Then uh, we do not have just uh, a, a commitment in terms of uh, uh, KPIs, but we do have a commitment also in terms of uh, uh, sustainable finance, uh, because uh, we have declared to the market that uh, we will reach around 48% uh, of uh, sustainable finance instruments by 2023, and uh, more than 70 percent by 2030 and uh, for example also with our last transaction in uh, multi tranche euro bond that we launched uh, june 8 uh, we have uh, uh, done the largest sustainability link bond ever on the market and uh, mm, we have also launched uh, a tender offer on, on our conventional bond and this of course is helping us uh, in enhancing our sustainable finance um, percentage, uh, switching from conventional finance uh, towards uh, a much more sustainable finance in general. Let's say that our objective is to have uh, sustainable finance uh, becoming uh, mainstream at a certain point in time. Unfortunately, we are uh, still speaking about two or three percent of the overall capital market when it comes to sustainable finance. So there is uh, still a lot of work to do here but uh, we do think that uh, uh, with uh, all the instruments uh, that uh, we we have on the table uh, and uh, we do think also that sustainability linked bond that can be probably used by a broader uh, a, a wider range of uh, company because they are um, more flexible less they can be used also for the less capex intensive company uh, for example this can help in enhancing uh, um, the sustainable finance uh, finance market. As I was saying at the beginning, I think that the three main, my main miles defied the success of the sustainability linked um, strategy. One, one uh, first and foremost, I would say the uh, release of the sustainability linked bond principles by the ICMA uh, that uh, put uh, kind of uh, a standardization that is needed on the market, both, uh, both on the issuer and the investors, uh, investor side. And the, uh, we do see the five main pillars uh, of these principles. So for sure, the KPI, they need uh, to be reliable and core for the company. Uh, then uh, calibration of sustainability performance target uh, that of course uh, need uh, to be challenged. Uh, then uh, bond characteristic. Uh, so as I was saying, uh, we do have a step up, for example, of 25 basis point in our bonds. Reporting uh, because transparency continue to be a um, cornerstone uh, of, of the sustainable finance. And uh, finally, the verification, uh, because uh, I think that uh, verification is uh, needed uh, both from the issuer side and investor side and provide once again transparency and assurance uh, for, for investors. Then uh, the ECB eligibility that uh, declare the, the board of, of a new asset cluster, so the sustainability link bond, and it was also the first time that we have seen a clear link between the EU taxonomy on, on one end uh, and the uh, sustainable development goals uh, on, on the other end. Uh, and this has been uh, for sure uh, another milestone. And then uh, uh, other issues um, uh, coming on the market with the, this kind of transaction because uh, of course, uh, as I was saying, uh, we need uh, standardization uh, and uh, we need also to have uh, this product um, helping the enhancement of sustainable finance uh, 
uh, and other issues uh, uh, when needed uh, to, to this market. Um, and then uh, here is just uh, uh, the, the main differential different differences that we have between use of proceeds financing and sustainability linked financing. I think that the main uh, difference is the fact that uh, probably sustainability linked instruments uh, give uh, an higher flexibility because of the general corporate purpose um, um, type of proceeds. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the fact that can be used by a wider range of uh, corporate and that can be also uh, used uh, in terms of uh, transition financing, transition more in general, not just transition financing. Uh, the important thing is to have uh, a reliable uh, KPI because the KPI is core for sustainability linked instruments. And finally, I just, uh, I just touched base uh, briefly and, and quick on, on development finance um, because we do think that uh, um, to have uh, a boost for sustainable finance, so we, we need not just uh, the, the private financing, but also the, pu the public financing. So we, we should have uh, private and, and public financing come together and, and work together boosting uh, sustainable investments. Um, and. Uh, a switch uh, from uh, a pure project base, uh, or, or let's say not not a switch, but adding a layer passing from a pure project base uh, towards a much more general corporate purpose. Also, when it comes uh, to sustainable finance, uh, could for sure help uh, in uh, providing uh, flexibility and, and um, enhancing uh, also this kind uh, of of market. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nicole, for that comprehensive presentation. It's all, all very interesting. Uh, we just have a quick panel discussion now. We're, we're about 10 minutes behind time. Um, I don't think that's that's too much of a problem. Well, one thing that occurred to me um, when I was watching Mark's presentation is to people who, 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 haven't, who haven't worked on um, implementing these kind of instruments, it, 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 it may appear at first look that it's a very complex and difficult thing to do. And I just wanted to ask uh, David and Nicole the, the, the same question, one from a, a bank perspective and one from a corporate perspective. Uh, maybe we can start with David first. Um, in reality, how, how difficult is this to do? And, and can you give some examples of, you know, on the ground implementation and, and what kind of uh, obstacles you may have had to, 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 to overcome to be able to um, uh, issue these instruments? Um, I think in the use of proceeds space, it's um, if the borrower has a large capex program and they have significant investment that they need to deploy towards clearly green projects or clearly social projects, it's relatively straightforward. It is challenging when there are new and emerging technologies where the environmental or social benefits have not yet been identified or qualified. Um, and that involves um, working with a second party opinion provider to ensure that it is credible. Um, the other challenge is treasury teams often won't look at these un unless they think there's a clear pricing benefit before they even begin. Um, the market is changing and I think the investor universe is growing all the time. So that there is an opportunity to, to benefit from pricing benefits. And with the emergence of sustainability linked debt, um, that is increasingly the case. And I think that's half the reason you're seeing so many corporates looking to access this space. Um, as Nicole would know, the sustainability linked approach is more challenging for to apply to all borrowers. Um, and it's not something for people that aren't committed and don't have a credible and ambitious sustainability strategy, I would suggest. Thanks, David. Nicole, do you have anything to add to that? No, I do agree with David. When it comes to, to green bonds, uh, uh, the, the, the fact is that uh, you need to have uh, a bulk of uh, reliable projects and, and green projects. Uh, and of course, uh, this is not always the case, uh, particularly when uh, it comes uh, to less capex intensive company. And on the other side, of course, it's true to say that uh, you are looking just at the projects, uh, but more and more investors are keen to understand uh, the sustainability strategy and the transition path uh, that uh, uh, we 
we see in the company. So it's uh, the challenge is uh, to focus not uh, just on the project, but to see also the strategy because the investors are asking also about the strategy. And we have seen also the um, update of Green Bond principles uh, that uh, are kind of introducing also an, an overall approach, not just uh, a single project approach. When it comes to sustainability link bond, the main challenge is to identify a reliable KPI that's needed to have a track record and uh, a path uh, towards, uh, toward the towards the transition. But for sure, the, the KPI is uh, core for, uh, for the sustainability link uh, instrument. Thanks, Nicola. Mark, did you have anything to add to that? Any observations on KPIs that you've come across or what, what, you, what you found works and what, what doesn't in terms of you know an organization's approach yeah yeah look from from a kpr perspective um the there needs to be a good representation in the kpis of an organization's key sustainability touch points you know if if you're making if you're making uh, car tires or electric vehicles you can't just go to market with a KPI that is about how many electric vehicles are being used in a particular developing country. That doesn't do justice to the primary sustainability risks and impacts associated with an organisation. So they need to be salient and relevant to, to an organisation. Good, thanks for that. Um, the, the, the other thing that I... Um, I was interested in, in 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 hearing from David and Nicole is um well I guess there's two parts to this to this question the the, the first part is um uh, what 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 kind of benefits are you seeing doing this as giving your organisation um, and not just reputationally or in the market but 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 also internally in terms of culture I'm I'm just wondering if if either of you would like to um, comment on that and. Um, I don't know who'd like to go first. David, you'd like to go first on this? Ah, I'll go if you like. Um, in terms of um, the impacts internally, um, it's most definitely um, highlighting what the bank is doing as a, both as an issuer and a ranger of sustainable financing has a dramatic effect. I mean, we've, we've certainly seen that as an issuer now that we've brought six green bonds um, and a social bond to market. We were the first to structure a social bond, which highlighted financing for companies that um, were actively promoting workplace gender equality. Now, that was a topic that was very, very relevant and, and very um, top of mind here in the Australian business world. Um, and it made a lot of sense uh, for, support, uh, for investors to support that. Um, th some of the other examples, I mean, we have no shortage of people that would love to be part of this business because it aligns with their their beliefs and purpose. Um, and I think that transition is happening rapidly. So I'll, I'll leave it at there and I'm sure Nicole can give a lot more examples. Thank you, Dan. And let's say that uh, to us, uh, as I was saying, um, uh, the, the main benefit is related to the fact that we do think that sustainability means value. And when uh, I say value, I mean, uh, financial and economic value. So we are not just uh, um, doing uh, sustainable investment uh, because it's the right thing to do, but it is also the, uh, the let's say, best way going forward to growth. And uh, uh, this is uh, also behind, I think, sustainable finance uh, because uh, we have decided to move towards sustainable finance as an L when our business was uh, mature enough. Uh, and uh, also beyond sustainable finance, uh, we, we should uh, have uh, economic and financial value, but just because uh, we do think that uh, uh, sustainable companies are more resilient, uh, stable cash flows, much more stable cash flows uh, and less risky. And therefore, uh, they they should deserve, they, they deserve uh, a lower cost of debt. And as of now, we probably miss uh, uh, one uh, actor in the market that are uh, the, the credit rating agencies uh, that uh, still uh, do not uh, 
fully embed uh, the ESG evaluation within uh, the credit rating, but once uh, we will have also these uh, uh, on the market, I think that sustainable finance will become really mainstream uh, and uh, probably there, there will be no need uh, to, to call uh, the, the product green, sustainable, sustainability link or social because yeah. uh, time uh, we, we will have sustainable finance uh, as uh, the main actor within, uh, within finance. Well, thanks, Nicole. That's, that's really interesting. Do you, think, do you think renewable energy companies like Enel will Will, will go beyond the current SDGs that you're looking at and expand into the other, the 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 the, the, the other SDGs. But as Mark was uh, was saying, uh, and I fully agree on that. Uh, I think that uh, when it comes to KPIs uh, on sustainable finance and sustainability linked instruments, uh, we need to have KPIs that are really core, especially linked uh, to to the business. Otherwise. Uh, it doesn't make um, sense because uh, we we have uh, to, to choose a KPI in, uh, towards which we can uh, have an impact. When it comes to NL more in general, we already report uh, on all SDGs uh, because if you look at our sustainability report, uh, we do have uh, uh, a, a reporting on all uh, the, the 17 SDGs. And also when it comes uh, to, to green bonds uh, that we have outstanding, for example, it's true to say that they are green bonds and we do have a green bond framework, uh, but uh, we, uh, we can call them uh, more probably sustainable bonds because we do not look just at the environmental aspect, but uh, we report uh, also on, on, on a broader uh, range of metric that touch also, for example, um, sustainable aspect and, and other SDGs. So yes, as an L, we look at all the SDGs, but uh, when it comes uh, to, to business in specific, I think that is the key to, to choose uh, KPIs that are uh, strictly connected uh, to, to your business, a, a tool which you can really impact. Thanks, Michael. That's, that's, that's really useful. Um, Mark, I'm just wondering um, if, if you were to give you know, and and um, elevate a conversation answer to someone who asked you, uh, we haven't done this. What what are the first steps we should take to 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 move into the space? What what kind of an answer would you give? Wow, um, where would you start? I guess you. Uh, I would ask what they want to achieve out of the project, uh, out of the process. You know, why why uh, are you looking to to bring this to market? And what we typically see is. Um, a lot of the conversations we have where people are primarily interested in coupon um, often don't make it all the way through the process. Um, if the motivation tends to be to broaden their, their investor um, audience um, or to reinforce their sustainability position, then that's really a good starting place. And then from there, we would talk about you know, potential use of proceeds or potential KPIs. And um, after that, we, we have a discussion about the underlying sustainability strategy. Do you have a science-based target in place? Do you have a long-term decarbonisation plan? How does this instrument or how do these instruments and mechanisms relate to your overall sustainability position? Thanks. That was very, that was perfect, I think. Uh, no. Elevator just got out at your door. Um, uh, and Nicole, uh, do, do you have anything you might want to add to that? No, uh, uh, even there, I think that uh, we we agree on that. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, also the external certification, I think that is uh, key when it comes uh, to sustainability linked uh, instruments. Uh, and, uh, and KPIs, uh, and uh, Mark mentioned, uh, for example, the science-based target initiative, uh, and uh, we do have a science-based target uh, certified uh, when, when it comes uh, to the CO2 reduction, GHG uh, reduction, and uh, it has been um, much appreciated from, uh, from investors and from uh, the, the financial community in general. Uh, because, of course, uh, having an external certification, uh, uh, both in terms of uh, KPIs and uh, also in terms, for example, of the framework and work that uh, you, you do as, a, as an issuer, 
uh, is a, a, a further assurance uh, for, for investors and the further, further assurance in terms of, uh, of, of transparency. So I think that uh, the, the, the work of a second party opinion uh, provider and of course also the work uh, when it comes to the assurance somewhere in general on the KPIs, for example, the, the auditor when it comes uh, to, to our side uh, and uh, the, the science-based target is, um, is crucial uh, for the growing of this kind of, uh, of instrument. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, David, anything else to add? Um, just building on Mark's point, I mean, sustainability links, um, as Nicole highlighted, it needs to be credible, it needs to be ambitious, it needs to be um, beyond the business as usual approach. Otherwise, from a bank or an investor perspective, um, you're entering into a transaction where people are expected to be paid for doing no more than they're doing normally. The whole point of the margin incentives on offer is to incentivize borrowers to continue to improve on their sustainability journey and to improve at a quicker pace to either meet alignment with the Paris Agreement quicker or improve their contributions. Um, and the way we as a bank lender look at it is long-term ESG risk. If that improves, then we'd expect longer term for the credit profile of the borrower to improve. Therefore, they should be eligible to, to receive a lower cost of funding. So, and that would justify the discount they receive because at the moment there is no capital relief from the regulators for any sustainable or green debt at this point in time. It's a very topical area, but um, that's how we, we look at these things. So I'm just interested in the business as usual element there. Um, it, what does that actually mean? If, a, if an organisation um, already has a sustainable pathway in their strategy, it, it already has a, yeah. a, a trajectory, mm -hmm. does, it, does it mean a reflecting that uh, trajectory in those KPIs or, or does it mean uh, an, an, an ambition beyond that trajectory? If you follow to the letter of the law, the um, the way that draft sustainability linked bond principles are, it's incentivizing borrowers to go further faster. Um, and that's the rationale for the incentives. We have seen borrowers that have come to market with previously stated goals um, and have linked their funding to that. Um, it's often a discussion because um, many corporate treasurers will come to market thinking, well, I'm doing all this good stuff. Why don't you pay me for it? Our response is the cost you, you pay to borrow should reflect that. It's what you're doing in the future, how you're going beyond where you are today that will be reflective of your pricing. So if you were to come to market a year ago and over a two year period, your credit profile has improved because you've addressed your ESG issues, then in two years time, you should be able to get cheaper, cheaper, cheaper debt. So this is one way of um, entering into that on day one. Thanks, David. Um, any, any opinions on that from the other panelists, Nicole, Mark? No? I, think you I, would, say, um, I would say Sorry. that it's relevant to a point. Um, every organization is different and you need to consider, to consider relative performance. So you wouldn't want to punish a, a, an organization that is already very far ahead of the curve um, but, it, you know, that when, when we consider these projects, we consider science-based targets. Where, where should these industries be performing? Where is the market performing? Where, where are the national targets at? Where, where, what market is this organisation operating in? What is their organisational context? And that paints a holistic picture of, of performance and relative ambition. And so then you need to go and weight all of those different inputs into that to, to, to get an understanding. And that's just from our perspective. Thanks, Mark. Um, look, we're, we're, all, we're almost at the time to open up to the floor for questions. I've already got a few questions through, so I can start with this. And I, I just also ask that if you're asking questions, can you keep the questions to um, the subject matter of the session? Because uh, that's, that's, I think, what this is about. And if you can focus those questions on, on uh, SDG linked bonds and sustainability linked bonds, um, uh, I, I think that would be useful. And they're the ones that I'll respond to. I, I have a question. Um, I, I guess it's to, um, to, to anyone on the panel. And it's because you talk about some actual projects that used an SDG linked debt instrument. Uh, you've given examples of them, perhaps 
this person wants some more detail. And, and any sample from a report which linked to an SG, SDG target, I'm not sure how you can provide the second part of that question, but perhaps you can speak to the first part of that question. Um, and Nicole, would you like to have a stab at that one? Uh, so Nicole, I, I'm just wondering if you wanted to respond to that to that question. You're, I think you might be on mute. Uh, uh, Nicole, we're we're not hearing you. Um, so perhaps um, uh, David, could you have a, I can have a shot at that? Yeah. Um, sorry, the, the the specific question, Noel. I mean, if you could. Just yeah, yeah, if, if you could just talk about, thing. yeah, uh, the question is what are some actual projects that use okay. an S SDG LinkedIn instrument? Sure, sure. So um, to give an example, uh, we've worked with a, a government issuer of sustainability bonds here in New South Wales. Um, and what they have done is they've identified eligible use pro proceeds. Now for them, it's a use of proceeds transaction where they're earmarking it for social and green projects now they've identified investments in public health care, public education, which in their case, they've identified the linkages to, um, I would need to go back and check their framework, but I believe it is ooh, um, good health and well-being. And then there's an, an SDG four, is it SDG four and SDG eight? And below that specific targets that, um, describe the, the improvements that are trying to be met as part of the contribution to the SDGs. And that's one way they do that. And when they publish their annual reporting, they also show the contribution towards the sustainable development goals. We've seen that very, very frequently with issues of green and social bonds, um, less so in sustainability linked examples. Um, Enel has tended to be um, a, very much um, leading the way in that regard, linking their contribution towards the, the SDGs, as well as meeting their targets around um, renewable energy production and avoided greenhouse gas. So Nicole, are, you, are we able to hear you now? Could you see if you can speak now? Uh, I had some problem okay, with the video. Right. So, so would, you, would, would you like to respond to that? And I, I think maybe you may even have reports available. I, I don't know, please, please go ahead. Question is uh, related to projects and then the overall strategy, right? Yeah, some some actual examples of um, of of where you've done this and um, whether you've reported okay. on it, and those and those reports are available. Uh, absolutely. Uh, as, as I was saying, we started with with green bonds. Uh, that is uh, much more focused on uh, on the reporting pro project by project and, and bond by bond. And so we do have reporting uh, bond by bond, and we have issued the three green bonds and and project by project when it comes uh, to to green bonds. Uh, we uh, have a green bond framework. Uh, and the Green Bond uh, Committee that uh, oversight uh, all the process uh, when it comes uh, to, to Green Bonds. Uh, the projects uh, that uh, we have funded uh, through the proceeds of Green Bonds uh, are mainly related to, of course, our renewables uh, uh, business, uh, also infrastructure and network business. Um, and uh, we have inserted uh, in uh, the last update in 2018, if I'm not mistaken, also, uh, our NLX uh, businesses, uh, that is the business uh, that will provide the service uh, to our, towards electrification. And uh, uh, given the fact uh, that we realize that uh, more or less uh, all our projects uh, were eligible uh, for, uh, for, for green bonds, uh, because uh, let's say that uh, more than 90% of our CAPEX are devoted to sustainable business. That's why we start uh, asking ourselves, uh, but why uh, just uh, remain stick to the project and not elevating the transparency at the strategy level? And that's why that we move towards uh, the so-called SDG link bond and then sustainability link bond after the ICMA uh, principles. Uh, when it comes uh, to the strategy, 
strategy as David was, was saying, uh, uh, the, the importance uh, there is uh, the, the commitment that you are taking towards the financial community and the path uh, that you are able to, to demonstrate uh, both in the, in, in the historic term, I think, uh, and of course uh, uh, in, in the future towards uh, the, the tradition. Uh, for sure, the, the GHG reduction is uh, something uh, towards which uh, investors uh, are very focused on, uh, also because it's uh, kind of uh, uh, a KPI that is applicable to many sectors, so not just to the energy sector, for example. On the other side, when it comes to renewable install capacity, that of course it's something that is key for our business because we are a utility company, but I can understand that it's of course something utility specific or energy specific. Uh, on the contrary, when it comes uh, to, to GHG, there is a lot of focus, and that's why, for example, we have inserted also a medium-term KPI, because at the beginning, we used uh, that just uh, the GHG reduction at 2030, that uh, is the target that is the science-based science -based target uh, certified as a line uh, with 1.5 degree of, of Paris Agreement. And uh, we also enhance uh, the target at, uh, at, 20, at 2030. But then uh, we realized that investors uh, needed also a kind of medium term KPI when it comes uh, to, to CO2 GG reduction to demonstrate uh, that uh, the path uh, was, was there. And that's why we inserted, for example, also a 2023 target in our framework this, uh, this year when it comes uh, to, to the GHG reduction. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, Nicole. Oh, did you have more to say? Did you have more? No, but yes, uh, I was Thanks. just saying that yeah. when it comes to reporting, uh, we, we do report in our sustainability report uh, for, for Green Bonds, and it's, uh, it's all public, uh, and uh, we do have also an, um, an assurance uh, from our auditor when it comes uh, to um, renewable install capacity and from um, the MV when it comes uh, to CO2 reduction. Thank you. So, and, and so if people want to see those reports, they can, they can go to your website, uh, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I have a question from Pia Kurdlat at PXP Sustainability. Uh, Pia says these were really great presentations, which is nice to hear. Thanks, Pia. Um, Pia asks, I'd like to know if these SDG linked financing instruments are geared more towards large corporates or have SMEs been using them as well? Um, it's a question. Any taker? <laughs> I beg your pardon? Sorry. Uh, uh the, 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 the uh, question I'll is, take you'll take it? Okay, great. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah. No, uh, let's say that um, when it comes uh, to, to issue, uh, it's uh, something that to me can be also applied uh, probably at um, a much smaller, let's, let's say small and medium enterprise, uh, but uh, they need uh, to be sure that uh, there is in place uh, a reliable uh, transition path uh, that uh, they have uh, reliable KPIs and uh, uh, somehow they are inserting uh, a financial covenant into into their uh, uh, into their uh, documentation uh, let's say that when we speak about sustainability link instruments to me we are speaking also about risk so the the question is probably also much more towards investors so if they are keen to invest in sustainability link instruments so for those companies that are probably uh, it depends i think on the risk profile of of the issuer and uh, on the um, path in terms of transition uh, that uh, they are willing to, to demonstrate uh, and, uh, and to pursue. And of course, uh, when it comes uh, to NERD, for example, we are speaking in terms of step up uh, of uh, 25 basis points. Uh, I'm not sure that investors, uh, for example, for, uh, for high yield company uh, would ask uh, the same uh, amount in terms of step up, uh, or maybe they could ask more just because uh, we are speaking about uh, a risky company. If we are speaking about a risky company, it's, it's all about uh, the, the risk profile of the issue, I think. Thanks, Nicole. Um, 
Next question is to Mark or David. Um, the question is, are you seeing evidence of a greenium benefit for issuance of green bonds in the Southeast Asia or South Asia markets? Um, I can go first and I can give my experience here in Australia and New Zealand. Um, what we are seeing is um, smaller new issuance concessions. So that's when a, an issuer comes into the market with a brand new bond line. They typically have to pay um, a number of basis points above where they would have their old bonds pricing. Um, but because of the demand to invest in sustainability, sustainable theme debt or green bonds, uh, we're often seeing that new issuance concession either reduced and occasionally going negative in our markets. It's much more pronounced in Europe, um, but we have seen it here where investor books have been larger. Uh, the investors have been much, much more motivated to, um, to receive an allocation. So um, if the price is reduced through the book build process, they're less inclined to um, pull their bid and walk away. Um, and that essentially contributes to a more competitive or a better pricing outcome. It's very difficult to, to say it's explicitly a greenium, um, reflective of this being a green bond instead of a, a traditional bond. Um, but we do see it, and it, that theme continues to be displayed here, possibly not as pronounced as what we see or saw in Europe through the latter part of last year and early part of this year. Thanks, David. Mark, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, look, we're, we don't particularly see uh, a, a lot of the outcome just in our role, but we do, fr from our regular issuers in the region, we are seeing people and getting feedback that they are filling their books easier or more easily um, with, with the green label. They're, they're open to a wider audience. But overall, what we're seeing is legitimate and real premium really being driven by institutional investors who have that mandate in larger markets. So you see places like Europe and, you know, in some cases and in some times in Australia and in Japan as well, where there are institutional investors trying to get their hands on as much of this as possible. And that's what, what will drive and, and drive open that greenium. But it's, it's a hard thing to quantify and it's, um, it's often one of those questions you get asked early in the piece, but um, it, you know, I think it's universally understood not to be the, the prime motivator. And I think in Southeast Asia in particular, you know, as the market expands, as the bond market expands, um, then, then you might see a trend that way. Um, Mark, I think the next question is for, for you. Are there any standards or requirements needed for a company to become a certified trusted or legitimate third party verifier in the market for SDG or sustainability linked bonds? Look, it's, um, it's a tough one. The, there's been a gravitation towards established names. So large multinational companies or established local companies that have a reputation for quality and trust. And so you see the, the large accounting firms, you see Sustainalytics, ourselves have multinational presence and um, to varying extents have reputations for delivering these sorts of services or similar services. So it's, um, there is a barrier to entry and I think it's, it's really a, a recognition and a size issue. Um, in a perfect world, it would be a little bit easier to, to, to enter in just based on merit and expertise and, and competence. Um, and you, you do see in some in some countries there are uh, incentives to use local issuers like in, in the MAS grant in Singapore and and just behavior in the US market like US uh, US domiciled SPO providers and verifiers who you would never otherwise have heard of are, are really making a good crack of the market so uh, I think it depends where you're from and what the motivator is but um, I think it's possible and it would be good to see. Thanks, Mark. Uh, next question is for Nicole. Um, uh, you, you mentioned uh, uh, step-down pricing when KPIs were were, were met, and the, the person asks, um, "Can they understand this was why this was not acceptable to the investors as of today?" That's the question. 
<clears throat> yes, let's say that uh, when it comes to loans, uh, we usually do loans with a step up and, and step down at a certain point in time. So we have a commitment, uh, a predetermined uh, uh, date, uh, and uh, if uh, we do not reach the target, we will have a step up or a step down when it comes to loans. On the other side, when it comes uh, to investors, there are a lot of investors, uh, majority probably insurance, uh, that, uh, that are long haul investors uh, that need uh, to have uh, a floor in their portfolio and uh, adding a step down um, do doesn't allow them uh, to have this kind of, uh, of a floor already set, uh, and that's why it's, uh, it's difficult uh, for them uh, then to manage uh, this kind of instrument, uh, technically, uh, because of the their internal uh, asset uh, liability management, uh, so the, the allocation that uh, they have to do internally. And that's why we have decided not to have this step down when it comes to bonds, but to have just uh, the, the step up. And uh, as I was saying, uh, at, the, at the beginning, uh, we asked uh, on the other side for a discount uh, when, when we launched the transaction that uh, represent kind of an evaluation of um, the embedded option uh, that we have given the fact that we are inserting a step up at a certain point in time. Thanks, Nicole. I, I have a question here on uh, incentive from investors for the investors, but I think I think that question was actually answered earlier um, uh, with the with the question around Greemium. Um, the next question is uh, a flexibility of SDG link financing was mentioned a few times. Could someone exp could someone explain once again where this is coming from? The, the high flexibility is mainly, I think, driven by the fact that uh, we do not have uh, a specific uh, use of proceeds. So the proceeds can be um, used uh, in, in, a flexible, in a flexible way. When it comes to reporting uh, for the uh, SLBs, uh, we are not reporting as an L on uh, the four on a project by project or, or bond by bond, but we are reporting on uh, the KPI, so on, uh, the, on, on our strategy mainly because uh, we have chosen a KPI that uh, uh, is embedded um, in our strategy and uh, uh, that, that's uh, another flexibility. And uh, um, I think most and, and foremost uh, uh, is uh, the fact that, that uh, investors are uh, uh, really aware and conscious of the strategy of, of the issuers uh, because uh, we are really speaking about uh, strategy, about uh, the decarbonization and, uh, and transition path uh, and not just uh, on, on a single project. So, the, the, but the, the higher flexibility is, uh, I think, mainly, mainly due uh, to, to the fact uh, that, uh, yes, uh, uh, proceeds uh, can be much used in a much more flexible way. Uh, reporting is on, on specific KPI and the for on, on, on the strategy. And uh, given the fact that uh, you do not need a specific project, uh, this product can be used also for the less capex intensive industries. I don't know if my colleagues have uh, uh, something to add uh, on that. Uh, David? Um. Uh, I struggle to give any examples at the moment. Sorry, Noel. Um, okay. Just thinking. <laughs> I think um, I but, think it's really outcome focused. You know, the 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 SDG linked financing is about affecting uh, affecting some sort of uh, of benefit, whether it be social um, development related or or um, environmental, that links up to to needed and desired specific goals and targets. So there is there is flexibility there in, in how you deliver that. And you know, from that perspective, it does allow you to to come at trying to solve the problem from a different a number of different angles and by different means. Thanks, Mark. David, did anything come to mind or um, yeah. I was really gonna say it's a, it's a broader spectrum and uh, to Nicole's point, you don't need to have a specific capex for specific green projects or social projects. So that really is where the, the flexibility does come from corporates. 
but with that does come an expectation that they have a credible um, and clearly um, described and uh, established sustainability strategy and they can pin and align their financings and link um, link the bonds or the loans to that. Um, so it is flexible, yes, um, but it comes with strings attached. Thanks, David. Uh, next question, um, a tenant was mentioned in the panel discussion. Does this mean SDG compliant risk, which, which has been said in quotation marks, uh, may be a risk to be taken into account to evaluate corporate's financial strength? It's already happening. So if you look at how credit rating agencies are acting at the moment, they are explicitly describing how ESG risk factors are being reflected in their credit assessments. Um, and under the European Union Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regime, they've been required to do that since earlier this year. Um, they have to explain how ESG factors factor into their credit ratings. That should reflect or provide a contribution towards pricing um, that people are, or corporates and companies are, are being asked to pay, reflective of their credit risk. Um, and I think increasingly so, we will see you are seeing banks incorporate ESG risk into their pricing models internally. Um, it is not uniform how that's done. And I think people are at different stages in that journey of pricing it in. Thanks, David. Um, other panelists would like to contribute to that question? Yeah. Nicole? Self, I think, because uh, in, when we come at the uh, at, the, at that point, uh, as I was saying before, probably there will be no need uh, to, to call the products in uh, green, social or sustainability or sustainability link, but uh, we will have uh, sustainable finance becoming mainstream. Uh, and uh, given the fact that uh, uh, ESG uh, is, is focused now, it need uh, to be considered, need to be evaluated within the data risk profile of, uh, of the mission, I think. Thanks, Nicole. We've got um, I think about four minutes left for the Q&A, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a follow-up question on the actual project examples. Um, this this, this follow-up question is, um, are the projects linked to an SDG target and how are the metrics uh, derived? For example, percentages in relation to SDG target measured. Um, perhaps, and, and I think, David, you, you said you might be able to share on your screen an example of a, of a report that you've done? Are you still able to do uh, that? Yes, yes. I will just have to track it down for you now. Sorry, I've, I've closed Sorry, that. Sorry, David. Down, but there we <laughs> yeah, um, and while you're doing that, while you're doing that, Nicole, perhaps you could uh, re uh, respond to that question. Well, uh, so the question is uh, why we are doing uh, the, the sustainability link strategy. No, it's more. It's more about how how you derive the uh, metrics. Are, are they percentages in relation to an SDG target? That was that was an example question. As I was saying, uh, let's say that uh, we do see finance uh, serving our business, uh, so we didn't start uh, from from sustainable finance, and that's why, for example, we started with green bonds just in 2017. Because if you look at Enel, Enel switched uh, uh, the, the, its business. It starts to switch its business uh, in 2014. Uh, we uh, kind of move uh, from uh, renewable, from uh, conventional business model, conventional uh, generation uh, to a much more renewable generation based. Now we do have uh, more than 50% of our production uh, that is renewable, uh, renewable based. Uh, and, um, yeah, that's why, for example, in uh, we started moving uh, also when it comes to finance uh, towards sustainable finance just in 2017, when uh, uh, our business was uh, mature enough uh, to allow us to finance um, speaking in terms of uh, sustainable finance, and we started we started issuing. Uh, uh, triggering bonds. So it's not, uh, I think, uh, when it comes to corporate, of course, uh, we are not doing uh, financial products. We, not, we are not a financial institution. We are a utility company, and therefore the finance that should serve the business. So we cannot start uh, from sustainable finance. Uh, we need to start from the business. And uh, for us in NL, it has been easy then 
to identify the metrics and KPI valuable uh, for, for the sustainable finance space, uh, we uh, just realized uh, that uh, uh, our CAPEX, uh, the majority of our CAPEX, more than 90%, uh, were devoted to sustainable finance. And therefore, we started working with our strategy department, uh, with our IR, IR department, and with our sustainability department. Uh, uh, trying to have uh, also the storytelling in line with our business. We decided then to read the ESG under the SDGs aspect, and then we just uh, uh, identify those SDGs that uh, uh, could be easily also understandable for, for investors, because of course, when it comes to capital markets, we need to have something to keep it simple, and uh, uh, to identify metric that uh, uh, should be uh, as a standard uh, as, as possible. And that's, uh, that's why for an end, we, we identified uh, the renewable install capacity that is of course linked to our global power, global power generation. And uh, yes, so of course uh, it depends uh, on the multiple projects that uh, are behind uh, the, the metrics and commitment uh, that we have taken, taken in terms of uh, a renewable install capacity because uh, we are able uh, uh, to to put uh, in place uh, more gigawatt because uh, of course uh, we have uh, a lot of projects towards which we are investing but uh, the idea here is uh, to uh, commit uh, on the percentage of renewable install capacity and of course uh, the, the ghg reduction that is the focus uh, not only for investors, uh, but for, for the world in general, because when it comes uh, to uh, transition and to decarbonization, also at uh, the uh, EU level and uh, also US level, uh, UN level, uh, the GHG reduction uh, is uh, it, it's, it's the point, because now it's true to say that uh, uh, we uh, should not focus just on the E aspect of the ESG, because also the social part, it's, it's important, of course, uh, but it's also true to say that now the, um, the let's say, the, the main issue that we have to solve and address is probably around the environment. Uh, and that's, uh, that's why I think that uh, uh, both in, in Europe and in US, uh, the legislation and regulators are mainly focused on the E part of the ESG given the fact that governance uh, has been probably already tackled in the past. Now we are addressing and focusing uh, uh, probably more on the environmental and we are starting also focusing uh, as uh, for sure EU also on, on the social aspects, I think. Thanks, Nicole. David, just quickly, are you ready to roll? Yeah. With, yeah. Yes, yeah, so um, if I'm able to share my screen at the moment, if you can see that. Um, so I'm not seeing it on the main screen yet. You're not seeing it on the main screen. Let me try it again. Um, I, I think it's for the for the producer to set up. Look, I, I don't. I'm, I'm not sure we're going to get there in time. Okay. I mean, I, I just uh, very quickly yeah. say so. In terms of the SDG contributions and the metrics. Um, there are some guidance notes and there's a high level sustainable development goal impact mapping guide that the ICMA Green Bond Principles team have published. If you go onto that website, one of the slides in my pack showed how the various SDGs had specific indicators they recommend and they align with the SDG targets underlying, for example, SDG seven, around affordable and clean energy. It has a target 7.3 and 7.2 sorry, 7.3 and 7a, which is around energy efficiency. And some of the indicators suggested are the amount of renewable energy produced, uh, the avoided greenhouse gas emissions as a result of those investments. So it gives a great deal of examples in terms of impact metrics, um, and this is improving all the time. Thanks, David. Okay, we, we've got a couple of minutes to uh, wrap up. Um, I, I think there's been a huge amount of information shared uh, in, in this session, and it's been incredibly interesting. It's been great to hear from people we have so much experience doing this. If, if I if I had had two takeaways, um, the, the two takeaways that meant a lot to me in, in this seminar was uh, that the first is um, that, um, that 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 an organisation who wants to go down this path needs to mean it, 
um, they they need to aspire towards in, in improving their sustainability performance. They 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 need to have robust KPIs which are meaningful and and have integrity on that side. And on the other side, I think the other really important message that we heard from uh, David and Nicola is that um, is is it this is a pathway towards mainstreaming um, that 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 uh, that that a uh, uh, sustainable finance will be mainstream. It's becoming mainstream now, and is actually critical uh, in terms of uh, managing um, uh, our financial risk as as we enter into an uncertain future with an awful lot of environmental and climate stresses in place. So once again, thanks very much to all the panelists. I, I thank you on behalf of the audience who joined us today. Uh, and I hope everyone is going away from the seminar uh, with a much better understanding of, of how these things work. So um, thanks, everyone. Thank you.